Hey everybody, it's fan favorite Greg here. Just popping my little nose in to say we had some technical difficulties that caused this episode to get disjointed in time, and therefore it falls after our finale. And I don't want to say it was my fault, even though it became clear in the process of this that it totally was my fault. Um, I would still like to blame Mike or perhaps Ryan, even though, again, it's very clear that this was my mistake. Well, without further ado... to Movie of the Year, the only podcast that has the science and the screaming determine what the best movie is of any given year. This given year? 2002. The most maxim year ever attacked by Movie of the Year. Before I introduce this week's panelists, know this, that I'm your host, Mike Gravano, and also know this, that this show is also a game, where points will be awarded for well-made arguments, cogent thoughts about the film, jokes, and anything else I gosh darn feel like awarding. The win will be my best friend for a week and have gloating rights. Your panelists are the bearer of blueberry muffins for the last week, Ryan. I, the term know this. Aggressive, Mike. I, you need to, we'll know what we want to know and stop telling us what we need to know. That was my problem with every teacher growing up is they're like, and maybe you'll learn this. Mm-hmm. No, shove it in my fucking face. Before, know this. Before every sentence. Know this. And his challenger of the week. Greg! Hey, everybody. It's me, Greg. I like I like a now yeah. hear this. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Because th- that is a little more in your face than listen up. Yeah. But not as hardcore as know this. Yeah. There's, a, there's a Trident commercial or something from when we were kids. And it would like say all these facts about how Trident helps. And it would start with, chew on this. Oh, damn. Ooh. So take that out for a spin. How about, how about put this in your pipe and smoke it? Both of those is how I start bedroom time. <laughs> hey, baby. Chew this, on this. Put this in your pipe and smoke it. All right, Write this down on a go. piece of paper, crumble it up, and shove it up your ass. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was a hardcore Mentos commercial that started with that. <laughs> That's a line from the film The Last Boy Scout. Uh, tonight, <laughs> we are here to talk about 2002's The Last Boy Scout. Which is what most people call 2002's Catch Me If You Can. Gentlemen, before this week, I know for a fact you'd both seen it, but what was your relationship to Catch Me If You Can? Boyfriend, girlfriend. I feel like I saw it in 2002 and enjoyed it. And, like, enjoyed it a lot. Um, But then did not, like, have a long-term relationship with it. I think this might have only been, like, the second and third time that I've seen it prepping for this show. There's this term that film people use. Um, Ebert actually uses it a lot. Uh, well, he'll, he'll call something like minor Spielberg. And I, yeah. That mm. bothers me for some reason. Drama. I know. It's a lot of drama. But um, then you watch a movie like this, and you're like, eh, it, that, that's what he's talking about. This is minor Spielberg. So he's not like James Cameron's Titanic minor Spielberg. <laughs> he, he only uses that about Spielberg movies. Yes. Yeah, he, it, it, they use it in literature a lot too. That like there's the canonical authors, and then there's their canonical their canonical texts, and then mm-hmm. you have like this the minor Dickens. Nobody's the minor talking about Twain, Franny and Zoe. Yes, for fucking Fitzgerald. Not yeah. till just now. I think you're the first person to. You're the first person to ever mention it in any way at all. <laughs> and I do think that 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 has been stuck with this movie, which is. Interesting and fun and delightful in a lot of ways, but maybe lacks some of the uh, emotional punch of. And I want to be clear too. Spielberg. Yeah, of the whatever the big ones are, but I want to be clear too that like minor Spielberg doesn't mean I don't think in anybody's whether it's Greg talking about literature or Ebert talking about film doesn't mean bad Spielberg. It's not right. Ready Player One is not minor Spielberg. Ready Player right. One is shitty Spielberg. You know, I just think that this is. Less and I, I think a lot of times I don't know if this is the case for literature, but it it gets confused with fun. Like there's major mm-hmm. works and then there's fun works, and yeah. they, yes. they can't be the same. And I don't know. I kind of would not be surprised today when the, in between all of the arguments and curse words and things thrown at each other, we kind of reveal that this is should be major. Wow. You know, like this should be a bigger deal, and it's deeper than people give it credit for. I think it's either the minor part of the major. <laughs> 
category <laughs> or the major <laughs> category or the minor category. Uh, there are moments this in this movie. Pinafore? It's or definitely <laughs> cusp. <laughs> There are moments in this movie where you're like, nah, this is just as good as anything else that he's done. But the problem is they're separated. They're like islands in a, in a sea of not bad, but just slightly less compelling Spielberg. This for years was uh, one of my go-to Christmas movies. I wonder why. Uh, <laughs> and then at a certain point, I just put away childish things. I don't know. I, was just, and I haven't seen it in like 10 years now. But yeah, it, it was definitely an annual rewatch for a while. This and that thing you do. Uh, where I just need my Hanks around sometimes the, around the holiday a normal season. Voice. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes a normal voice, sometimes a voice nobody has ever talked in since Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just dive our little dirty hands right into Catch Me If You Can. After over 20 years of Hollywood trying to adapt the story of Frank Abagnale Jr.'s life into a movie, <laughs> we finally got it with Leonardo DiCaprio as Frank, James Gandolfini as Carl Hanready, Ed Harris as Frank Abagnale Sr., and Chloe Sevigny as Brenda Strong, directed by Gore Verbinski. Almost, but then Leo had to do research for a little movie called Gangs of New York, and Hanready was played by Tom Hanks, Frank Sr. by Christopher Walken, and Brenda by Amy Adams. After struggling to find the right director for the job, producer Steven Spielberg said, I'm going to pull a move from that guy from Jeopardy's handbook and say, fuck it. I'll take the job myself. This led to some changes about the parents in the movie and a different ending from Abagnale's book, which actually led the book's new edition to change so the movie and the book would line up. Because truth <laughs> definitely mattered to everybody involved in the story of Frank. <laughs> Taste buds, I ask you this. Spielberg might be the patron saint of this show, but as we were talking about before the break, is this one of his top tier films? And do the roles of the mother and the father hit different now that we've seen the Fablemans? Mike, I'm going to start by saying I think Spielberg was the patron saint. But it is now that producer from Jeopardy who said, fuck it, I'll do it myself. Because that guy is a legend. <laughs> you guys, I just figured out who the host should be. <laughs> oh, really? Who? Who? We've Me. Been waiting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Lord it sh- move. It should be somebody who we would trust enough to make the choice for who the host should be. And somebody brave enough to say it should just be them. It's me, everybody. Well, only have to, I'm saving the show money. Only have to do one paycheck now. <laughs> It'll be bigger than my current paycheck. So, Mr. Spielberg, uh, you cast the two leads for Catch Me If You Can. Who'd you have in mind? I cast me and me. <laughs> I'm going to play both of them. I did think it was interesting. The The big change between the first time I saw this movie and this time was that I have seen Fableman since mm-hmm. then. And I did feel like, oh, okay, he was working through some of his childhood stuff with the mom character here, <laughs> including the way you think it's going to turn out to be totally messy, but it actually turns out to be kind of clean and done kind of above board. Like, yeah, I was fooling around on your dad and I got caught, but I'm going to divorce him now. We're going to do it official. And then I'm just like, I'm going to move on. I'm not going to just keep running around behind right. his back. And I, And to do like, you know what? Both the mom and the dad are fuck ups in this movie and how they treat their kid. But I'm gonna stay on the dad side because uh, Steven Spielberg wrote this character. Boys, I, boys. I think that um, what I didn't see or I couldn't put words to the first time I saw it that I can now, particularly because of the Fablemans, is that what what does it mean to have a normal relationship with your parents, with your mom, and with your dad? And there's so many weird ones in this movie. Um, the relationship that he has with his parents is oddly sexual. Like there dude, is, yes, dude. What the, the shit? There is something about them being a little thruple. Um, him just watching them dance, and the mom's just handsy with them. In the first fifteen, and minutes, and they tell this story, and then she's is, Chris Rock is like, and I see this beautiful blonde lady, and he's like, bombshell. She's a bombshell. <laughs> it's like, whoa, Sorry. chill out, little it, man. Yeah, and. They're clearly very close, right? And I kind of wish that maybe they had a second kid to sort of separate everyone. <laughs> Just um, honestly, but a you, buffer kid, a buffer kid, yeah. <laughs> not a like stronger than DiCaprio, not like buffer, but like, <laughs> no, but a, like a buffer, the sexuality slayer. Uh, <laughs> that's very good. Um, you see this later when they all uh, Martin Sheen's family is all watching some people sing about an Irish Whoa. guy. And he's like, come here, Amy Adams, jump right into daddy's lap right now. And I know your th- soon-to-be husband is sitting next to you, but being but daddy's, daddy's lap. lap. Is- <laughs> <laughs> and I, you see this the whole time. Like, th- it, It's not all as sexually charged as these examples. Those are just the most fun to talk about. But um, 
also the movie doesn't view them in the way that we're viewing them it actually portrays i think the movie portrays these as both normal interactions they just seem a I, lot for the audience i don't know if the movie is making a judgment i don't know if it's saying these are normal interactions i think the movie's saying some families exist like this the, mo- the, mo- the, the part where brenda <laughs> strong climbs onto her dad's lap i know that, that that's weird to watch but that is like supposed to be a triumphant moment in the movie where leo has Pat, where Frank has patched well, together a family. But it's close to his family that was warped, and I think it's very telling how easy these overly close, handsy families are and how both of these kids are booted or run away from the family. Like These yeah. were both broken families in different reasons. And so it's saying, like, you know how the people who just meet, they're like, we are best friends. It's like, <laughs> you're trying a little too hard. Yeah. Hey, Marty, you kicked Brenda out because she had an abortion for three years. And now you're being like, nah, nah, she's been sitting in my lap forever. I've always loved her sitting in my lap. I mean, it's, she lost her purity, and then a guy comes along to kind of restore mm. her honor, and that's when he can, like, accept his little girl again. Barf City. And th- throughout the movie, too, like, any like, anybody who wasn't as broken, less broken than Leo is in this movie, would tell his dad, tell his dad to kick <laughs> rocks long ago. Like, this guy is a fuck-up in so many ways, which I really want to dive into just that character in general. But, you know... Almost right away, besides uh, Leo just never leaving his side and always respecting him, looking up to him, he he makes the relationship b- between him and Hanratty weird almost as soon as possible. You know, pushes uh-huh. it towards uh, a mentor mentee all the way into wow. being a father. You know, and it's not on purpose. He's not saying like this could be my dad. This is just what he needs. And right. you know, there's an argument to be made that he he commits um, crime after crime to keep Hanratty in his life. Well, because don't we think? Th- that at least in part that one the message of the movie is that it's not love to give everybody everything that they want and right. to tell them that they don't have to become what? different than they are. What is love is holding people accountable, establishing boundaries and trying to bring out like the best in each other. Right. Instead of and, and like to stand in the truth of your relationship, which almost nobody in this movie naturally can like kind of stand in the, the light of truth. And then I think the scene that handles that the most is when it, the scales start to fall from Frank's eyes in his dad is when he's like, dad, tell me to stop. Like he's, yes, he knows he's yeah. addicted and his dad's like, no. Yeah. You just keep going. Go to Tahiti, Hawaii. Go to Tahiti, yeah. Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you know, you can't, you see that I am destroying myself and then can't you tell me to stop? Because if you don't, I can't. And he's like, well, my thing is I can't tell you to stop. I can't check your behavior. I don't have that ability. Yeah, because I mean, like... you're doing what I did, but so much better than I ever did. Yeah, and not failing and not being humiliated. I think there's so much about humiliation in this movie. And what? he finds a way to skirt around humiliation. And almost no character gets that. It's, I mean, it's such an interesting relationship, an interesting dynamic, because, you know, so many characters, so many people in real life, uh, human characters, are you know, propelled by making their parents proud. They want to make their parents proud. But we never stop and think, like, what if, what would make your parents proud? And what if that thing is awful, you know? And kids will still go for it. So Christopher Walken is, for lack of a better term, a criminal. Like, it doesn't, the movie does a really good job of not ever completely explaining what Walken's past is or how much the government is really after him. You know, like, he just hates the IRS. He's always dodging them. But it's clear that, like, he he likes to get around corners. He likes to mm. skirt whenever he can. And yeah, this is what makes him proud, you know? Like, he develops kind of like the touchstone con, which I'm I'm not quite sure exactly how it works, but it involves like the necklace thing. We see we see him do that as part what? of the, like I'm gonna try to razzle dazzle this bank manager. It's just straight yeah. bribery. So okay, because it's so weird. It's like, hey, I I found this necklace. Is it yours? But does the woman think it's a gift or she understands it's a bribe that she's being given she a gets necklace that it's to... a bribe and i think back then propriety just meant let's not deal with the ugliness of what's happening and say yes. it out loud <laughs> but i think there's an extra to the necklace because he could just be like hey give me i'll give you 50 bucks if you let me in there's something about the story that comes around the necklace you know mm. like there's a, a little added wow. i found this outside is it yours that adds to like the charm of the two abby nails you know like they definitely rely on the wink and the smile as part of their con because people don't want the truth people want a lie that they can sort of get lost in and it's playing with like america 
loves its outlaws. Always has. And these days it's muddier. But yeah. until like <laughs> 1980, America loves its outlaws uh, I think in pure clean fashion. I think there's something to the prop comicness of it, too. Like, <laughs> the way that it drops out of his wow. hand is just, like, it's a lip, bit like he's a magician. And then the way that it yeah. swings is a little hypnotic. Which is why, oh, man, that's good. Wow. Which is why uh, Leo fucks up in several ways. Is It's not already in his hand the way it was in his dad's. Mm-hmm. He has to, like, fumble his bag. And then it's also because he's fumbling his bag, he does not see that the bank manager is now there. Slipped in there. Yeah. But- <laughs> The fumble is the thing that ruins it. Like, you've got to be smooth. You've got right. to be walking esque. And he learns that. Like, that's why he's not good right away at conning. He, like, sees it, and he, he, but you watch him excel and get his talent and skills. I it's know, very uh, easy to forget that he's, like, 16, 17, yes, 18 for yes. a lot of this movie. Like, the movie does a pretty good job, um, like, appointing the, the actors so that they look as young as they're supposed to, because Amy Adams is supposed to look very young, and I think mm-hmm. she pulls it off. Well, braces. A little braces bit more. Help. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess the braces really do a lot, like the the hairdo and everything. But her manner, I think, is very childlike. But yeah. because he's supposed to be an advanced kid, I think there's a lot of scenes where I personally felt like I would sometimes lose sight of the fact that he is such a young guy because yes. he's acting like an adult. And so you can kind of forget that until so you forget how much of a novice he is about everything. The first 30 minutes has a lot of like his hair is messed up and he's sitting awkwardly. But yeah. the movie just kind of does away with it. If he had just been yeah. in a propeller hat with a giant lolly the entire time, <laughs> that would have solved the problem. I, I don't think people would have trusted that doctor as much. <laughs> <laughs> is it my big lolly? Is it my big lolly? Uh, <laughs> refocusing on Spielberg a little, we've talked about throughout this season that 2002 is the most bro Maxim, FHM, sex-filled era that we've ever covered. How does history's most sexless director deal with that there i feel like did we almost get a boob in this movie i feel like there was almost a full-on boob in in this film which might have been a a first for the most part i think he tried to inject a little bit of that in here but it's still like he has a innocence about sex about him where it's like he would much rather show the like table getting rocked and then just be like okay they were doing it or show the a, a vase of flowers being rocked and you think it's going to be sex and then it turns out not to be. Or the laundry machine like swirling and you think for a second it's sex and then it turns out not to be. Or a guy so sees I a think girl did... walk into a room and the front of his tuxedo just flies up and smacks him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he tried to dip into a little bit of that 2002 Carl's Jr. commercial energy. But I, I think that because of the time it is and because Leo starts 15... I think it does capture that, like, all I want is sex. That's I forgot what a poonhound Frank is in this movie. That that is like what driving him more than running from the law is getting tail. And which again, sorry, this goes back to our Patreon segment where we talked about Leo. Um, but we talked about how all of these roles between O2 and today are just remixes of the Leo <laughs> character, and that poonhound thing is definitely a part of it. Wow. And. But it is with, like, a gleam in his eye and an innocence. Like, it doesn't have the unsavory, he only dates 19-year-olds yet. Oh, I think that this movie would have been much different and much worse. Because, like, this is what Leo is good at, right? Is Everybody just roots for him. Um, the handsomeness is, a, like, it's a bonus and not something that gets in his way. If you switch this out with, like, Ryan Reynolds... And with mm. that comes that attitude and all of that, or like Smarm. Sh- Sean William Scott, if we want to get super O2 I would about it. I love if Sean William <laughs> Scott was in this. If we threw Stifler in there. Um, that totally changes because, you know, those two, Ryan Reynolds plays a lot of characters that sort of just float through life and say funny shit and it just works out for them. That would have ruined the movie, you know? Right. Wow. Well, there's clearly nothing else to say about Steven Spielberg in this movie, so we're going to take the quickest of breaks, and when we come back, visit a little mountain for the final time. Mount Rushmore! Mount Rushmore is, of course, in one of those Dakotas. <laughs> it was built as an ode the four most ghost-busting presidents we've ever had. <laughs> and in honor of those fearless men what we're going to do today is build a mountain to the four most ghost busting actors of 2002 who would be cast 
I'm going to say this as plainly as possible. Who would be cast into Ghostbusters if it was remade in O2? <laughs> <laughs> Starting with you, Greg. I think this is always an occasion for us to remember that the Ghostbusters song um, features the line, Bustin makes me feel good. <laughs> which I think, like... Which I believe Dan Aykroyd did into a ghost mouth a in ghost the first mouth. movie. Dan wow. Aykroyd's writer for this film concluded that he got to wear Civil Era, Civil War era <laughs> uniform and get blown by a ghost. The dream. Uh, in 2002, if we want the someone with the comedic chops, but also like the physical comedy chops, and also somebody who has experience fighting weird little guys with <laughs> unusual technology, I think we got to go with Will Smith. Ooh, um, mm. The slapper himself? You don't want to see... The slap captain? You don't want to see his hand where his proton <laughs> emitter be at. Um, That's a classic right there. <laughs> he could put on the, the jumper, and I don't know, maybe he could look at it and say, like, you know what the difference between me and you, it, it, Dan Aykroyd, is? And he could say, I make this look good. And then people just go nuts. What? So do you think when an actor is cast in a movie, they just say lines from their other movies? Ryan, that is very clear. <laughs> That that's what I believe, okay? I've made several comments that indicate that I think that the actors are not actually people themselves, but are one of the characters they play, mm -hmm. and that when they appear in other movies, they have some of the characteristics from that character. Well, you are picking a, the right actor who uh, has very little range, but gosh darn it, is he always a good Will Smith. <laughs> and you know what? What? Will Smith is the first head on this mountain. Oh, yeah. This is the year of Men in Black 2. This would, of course, be a year where he crushes it as a Ghostbuster. Men in Black 2, a movie that we left off the bracket because it would dominate so much. Yes. We just <laughs> double Johnny Depp, not Johnny Depp, double Johnny Knoxville's would have crushed. <laughs> and the CGI, too beautiful. Ryan? I. This is a weird thing to prep for because. I think it was very strong in my memory that we've done like 01 and 00 <laughs> yeah. and 04. And a lot of these Ghostbusters have been talked about. Um, I wanted to see if we can make it a little more 02 specific, maybe. Um, and so I'm going to go with the one that Mike just spoiled for everyone. It's Johnny Knoxville. It's Johnny Knoxville. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is not – usually we're trying to sell as many tickets as possible. Um, yeah. to the theater. Johnny Knoxville has never been like a huge draw in that way, but I think that with the uh, with the Will Smith thing, maybe it'll be fine. And is he a Ghostbuster proper? He's not. You're not saying he's such not a box office sale that he should be a Lewis Tully. No, no Lewis Tully here. I think that I want him on Whoa. the poster in saying Bustin makes me feel good. And you know, he maybe falls off a roof and then you just really make him do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. We Maybe know you we'll love doing stuff like this, Johnny. Ghost jizz. <laughs> we always talk about how movies of like the 80s and 90s, if you cast a stand-up, he'll just get a chance to like do his bit as like a rant yeah. in a scene uh -huh. or whatever. <laughs> so by that rationale, Knoxville has to be thrown through a building or something. The, the staple of Marshmallow Man sets up a giant its own hand that if you walk in with a thing of donuts on yes. a tray. <laughs> Fuck, that's the funniest thing that has been in any movie in the history <laughs> the of time. Best. I would just think about that giant hand <laughs> slapping trays and laugh alone in my room. <laughs> God, and uh, just uh, it makes me think about their relationship as a group of friends. Because if one of the three of us did that to another one of the three of us, we would never speak to that person yeah, again. Done. It's just so weird how they will still, all these years later, like casually just walk into a room <laughs> where several of them already have been. I seriously, I would never stop like. <laughs> Looking in the room slowly, <laughs> scanning, clearing all the corners. Well, I think Crawl it's... down so your head's only an inch off the ground. Yes, so yeah. Gonna... <laughs> I think it's Aaron in that particular skit with the giant hand who's like, hey, where'd you guys want me to set all these soups? I bought you all of these soups. Because <laughs> he's carrying two trays. How fucking stupid are you, dude? <laughs> well, Aaron's going to Aaron, man. It must that be. Is, that is why they're friends with him. Don't you think at this point, though, when they're like, hey, I need you to carry all these mousetraps, you're just like, all right, I'll yeah. carry them. And then you're just like, you have to almost kind of lie to yourself. Yeah, like, surely. <laughs> uh, I want to nominate that giant got a producer, hand. Dave. The giant, <laughs> hand, the giant hand is a Ghostbusters. I want now. the giant hand in a Ghostbusters costume. <laughs> I'm putting the giant hand on the maybe pile. It's giant... not a terrible idea. <laughs> that hand's Knoxville gotten a lot of laughs. Is on the mountain. Greg, who do you got? 
Well, guess what, Ryan? I also wanted to make this 2002 as funk. Uh, and so I went through a list of all the movies we watched. And I'm being absolutely serious when I say this as my second pick. I really think Ghostbusters 2002 could use the Coog. I don't think they've ever had an oh. actor like Steve Coogan from uh, 24-Hour Party People. Um, and I just... He did so much physical comedy in 24-Hour Party People. He, like... He does this thing where he's like he is elevated, but he's willing to let himself be ridiculed. So he's like the perfect clown, a la The Simpsons. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, I don't think they've had quite that somebody with like a lot of dignity. Uh, and if you have a British accent and you use long words, you just naturally dignity. have dignity. And then he gets hit with the big hand. Come on, <laughs> that's too much. We're gonna give him the soup. You know, when you were talking, <laughs> um, I was thinking, what a perfect Walter Peck for yeah. this new Ghostbusters because Coogan's just sort of got that attitude. He works for the EPA. He comes in and he's like, but Walter Peck, you have to fucking hate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Coogan, given those lines, now you'll like him, you know, because yeah. he has that job or he has that like ability to be the worst person that you somehow think is hilarious. Um, I don't know. I mean, obviously I think it's a terrible idea because I want, I don't want you to get points, but other than that, it's pretty good. I do think that we're going to look back at the years of, coogan's career and we're gonna be like man did we really get the most out of that guy like we kind of let him be in really small stuff and we never really like we rarely utilized him effectively when he said the coogan Coogan kunk crossover sometimes uh what coogan kunk crossover oh kunk Kunk. triple c really hit that that k you want to hit that k at the end yeah get in there really get in the pocket of that (laughs) um when he said the coog mike did you think ryan coogler just a 12 year old kid in 2002 (laughs) starting this movie and I was confused. You know, we don't know how confused. he connects. It's the time to find out. <laughs> uh, but for the sake of drama, drama Coogan yeah. is on the maybe pile. Not because it's a bad idea, but because drama is so important. Drama is just so important. It's what I live by. <laughs> Ryan. Um, going back to comedy, selling the most tickets. Uh, I, it's absolutely baffling to me that 20 years ago, um, a movie like Str- uh, Sweet Home Alabama could come out and make $130 million. No IP, no nothing. It's just, oh, Reese Witherspoon is in, it, this looks like a romantic comedy. $130 million fucking dollars. Uh, it's all because of that baby in a bar line. You brought a baby to a bar. Boom, 130 <laughs> You know who that See, was that brought that. it? Who? Who? Ryan Melon Really? Linsky. Yep. We love her. Future America's Pop Filter Hall of Famer. For sure. Uh, I love that pick. I love the outside the box thinking. I disagree. I think Alabama is in itself IP. <laughs> it's based on a state. Uh, but Reese Witherspoon's on that maple pile. Wow. The misogyny in this podcast is thick. <laughs> Greg? Um, well, then, to combat the misogyny, I will recommend an actress named Jackie. Jackie Chan, uh, a <laughs> powerful <laughs> comedic actor. Plus, we got to think budget. We got Jackie Chan going. We're not going to have to have a stunt person. Just tell Jackie it's safe. Send him out there. <laughs> uh, just, I mean, I don't know if this is doubling up on it or just two great things that make it perfect, but Jackie Chan kicking Johnny Knoxville all up and down the street. Yeah, yeah Jackie dude. v. Johnny. One of them gets possessed by a ghost and then have them fight for a while. The other actors take five days off. You're not going to need a stuntman for Knoxville. You're not going to need a stuntman for Jackie Chan. You're clearly not going to need a stuntman for the big hand. I mean, <laughs> like we're going to be making this movie on the cheap. All right, why don't we just do Chan, Knoxville, big hand, second big hand. And we'll, call, <laughs> we'll call it a day. No movie can handle two big hands. Oh, man. Do you, how surprised would you be? The one big hand comes out and smacks the donuts out of your hands, and you're like, oh, I remember this. A second big hand? That's going to be the least <laughs> going to be expecting the big hand ever. The, the first big hand throws you backwards, and then as yes. you're flying backwards, another big hand slaps your ass forwards. Dude, this is what's been, if they ever do another one of these movies, there's going to be a second big hand. There's a lot of <laughs> possibilities. Um. May I guys, may I remind you guys famously that the poster for Ghostbusters two has the logo have holding two fingers up. <laughs> oh yeah. What if it was five fingers and that hand was giant? <laughs> <laughs> and it covered everybody's face. You only see a corner of Will Smith and Knoxville's faces. 
Uh, but Jackie Chan's on Maple Pile, Ryan. Um, I am going to. Uh, we want some. Uh, lots of people pulled in here. Um, what if the fourth Ghostbuster or wherever we're at was a little bit shorter, but talked a little bit faster? Because it's Eminem. What if Eminem was this <laughs> Ghostbuster? Holy shit! I thought for sure you had you had picked my next pick. Is yours that- the green Eminem with the white boots? My next one is Stuart Little from the Stuart Little <laughs> movies. Imagine him with a tiny little proton pack, Adorable. right? He's driving along. He's got like a model of the Ghostbusters car that he <laughs> drives in. And it's again, Stuart Little rules are if you can climb into it, it will function for you as if it's a real vehicle <laughs> driving around. Oh, that'd be so cute. Yeah, that bitch would just sit in the matchbox and like f- turn a fake key and it, the matchbox would start driving. But yeah. That's not how shit works. That uh, is how shit works. I'm fine with the talking mouse that wears clothes, but <laughs> it's magic powers <laughs> to make anything happen. Okay, so are we back to Ryan then? If both yeah, Eminem sorry, because rather than say anything about his party. selection, I just immediately jumped in and said my own. Uh, yeah, I've been on babies. this podcast before. <laughs> uh, the uh, you get a bunch of points because you got Mike's secret pick is still out there, guys, wow. and it is now speed choice. Um, okay, so I'm going to go with Mike's favorite person, and Mike loves Sean William Scott. <laughs> I do, but no. Greg? Adam Sandler. Oh, that's not terrible. <laughs> right? Um, if, if we're going to go big, uh, we should probably talk about the number one comedy of the year, uh, Mike Myers. Oh, Mike Myers, behave. <laughs> was there one of the Austin Powers in this year? Was it Goldmember? It was Goldmember, yeah. Ugh, that fucking I feel like we man. have rediscovered that, you and me, Mike, every episode this season. Yeah, that, <laughs> it just forced memory hold because I just always think of him eating his own skin and want to bomb it. <laughs> you each get one more. I'm going to go with... It's to me, right? Yes. I'm going to go with... Now he cares. David Arquette. <laughs> Oh, so it's eight legged it, freaks. Now it feels silly, but 2002, I think he would be the perfect matchup for Ghostbusters. Do you want to do our Tully's now, too, or is that later? Yeah, let's do uh, our Tully's after our main four. Okay. Um, the only other person that I think would sell a lot of tickets is that I have written down here is Ashton Kutcher. Ooh, the Cooch. The Cooch and the Coog in the same movie. <laughs> can, 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 can you even do that? I like it. Your nobody got the super special bunch of bonus, which would have been coming hot off of Bridget Jones' Diary the previous year, and even hotter in Chicago. Renee Zellweger would have gotten you so many points. I said Reese Witherspoon. That's basically I, the same thing. I was so close to hit again. I was like, wait, he kept talking. Hold on, let him keep going. Your Mount Rushmore of 2002 Ghostbusters is Will Smith. Johnny Knoxville, Whoa. Coog the Coogan, and Greasy Reesey with her spoon. Whoa. And now, who is your Lewis Tully? Who who are your submissions for Lewis Tully? Uh I'm uh, gonna I go pick from this list. I'm gonna go with Toby Maguire. Interesting. I'm gonna go with somebody who is like that but just smaller, and it's Frankie Muniz. It's time uh, to he go is from, smaller. Uh, uh, he's like from, a whole size smaller. <laughs> Malcolm in the middle to the big screen. You're both Whoa. wrong. It's Sean William Scott. Of course, <laughs> he's the perfect Lewis Tully at that time period. That is your O2 Ghostbusters, and that is your final Rushmore of this season. We're going to take the quickest of breaks, and when we come back, the final second taste bud of this season. Taste buds. How much of this movie relies on or takes advantage of the two biggest leading and likable actors of its time? Does it make you wish for the days when stars were stars? And how well does this on-screen pair work? I think they're great. And like, and it's not even like necessarily a chemistry. It's just that they're both great individually, so they would be great together. I'm not seeing like a uh, Redford and uh, Newman or a Pitt and Clooney sort of thing. It's just they're just great. Would they elevate? Yeah. Yeah, that's re- I mean ultimately that's that's re- exactly where it is. It's like they both do a good job. You can't say either guy is doing poorly. They don't share a, a ton of screen time, but when they do, it's not scintillating. It's not I I don't know, it's not like a charm offensive from both of them. It 
doesn't really feel like they add to each other in any meaningful way, which is not to say that they're not each right. good in their own way. It's just I never felt like the heat coming off the screen. I mean, speaking I, of it, it's not that. It's not heat. It's not, it's not heat. the one scene in the middle, where, and that's all you get. But really, their most dynamic scenes, the ones that have them at their best with the best dialogue and the best rapport, they're on the phone. You know? Yes. The, Christmas yes. phone calls. Wow. The Christmas phone calls, and it reminds me of a pillow. Is it Pillow Talk? Was that that movie with Rock Hudson? Doris Day. And that and Doris Day, they they never want to show them sleeping next to each other, but they're always talking. To, but that is like you are on fucking fire when you're on the phone. Yeah. And talk and Greg, you I think often talk about this, and now I can't remember if it's on air. Or just the unrecorded conversations we have in real life from time to time, that there's a different version of you when you are on the phone. Yes. And so they're both a little more awkward and nervous when they meet each other in real life. But when they're on the phone, they're just like, ha hello, game of cat and also cat, my nemesis. I, the thing that I think we watch build throughout the movie is it's obviously the relationship, but in a very specific way because they need the there's this game of cat and mouse that's going on and, you know, it's Tom Hanks' job, as he says multiple times, you know, whenever, like, Frank's like, could you just stop? Like, just let me make this money, man. He's like, it is my job. But so throughout the beginning of the movie, um, Hand Ratty is thinking, like, what is the best strategy here? Like, do I befriend mm-hmm. him? Do I uh, act like an asshole? Blah, blah, blah. And as the movie goes on, he becomes more of an organic father figure person. In reverse, uh, or not in reverse, in the same way, um, Abagnale starts as like, you know, you're never going to catch me. I'm the smartest. I'm the supervillain, and I'm enjoying it, and becomes more organic as well. So we sort of get them mm-hmm. coming together in this relationship. It's funny because you watch Han Reddy's team actually get bigger, and you like watch them start to take it as more and more of a big deal. And that's right when um, Leo wants to, when Abagnale wants to tap out. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. no, honey. It's like a whole international thing now. Like, if you steal a million dollars, they're like, hey, if you steal four million dollars pushing to five and six, they're in, like, okay, wait, cut it the fuck out. In 1950s <laughs> money, too. Like, yeah, yeah that, which that has was a to buttload be. of money. Um, I understand how things work and what Frank is doing is illegal and needs to be caught, but. I still think that the government is spending more on the chase than he was actually stealing. Like, yes, that's a, it seems like that's it. a big, long case they were trying to put together. Well, because they're they, flying they, numerous FBI agents across the globe yeah. to find him. It's big. It becomes a big international story, and I think that that applies an extra amount of pressure. You know, it's like on the front page of the New York Times, and so they have to. It stands there as like a hey, this guy's flouting everything, and also isn't our current checking system really easy to defraud if you put together a little bit of effort so i think there's this idea that it's like also kind of trying to fix um, yeah yeah like future things and stuff and 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 to deal Mm -hmm. with it that way because if you remember the way the movie is set out at first they don't give a shit Mm -hmm. like the other fbi agents are making fun of hanratty for trying to be like hey shouldn't we catch this guy (laughs) kiting these checks Uh, and they're like only "Uh." women care about checks buddy (laughs) yeah uh, i believe the women take care of the money in the household or we just have to earn it oh and then that guy does my favorite thing that hilarious dudes always do which is make some shitty misogynistic comment like that and then look around the room while yeah. he's laughing to make sure he got the laughs that he yeah huh did you hear what i said and pr- a big part of that is we see hand ready go through the opposite per- like process that we see abingdale go through and that we see abingdale senior go through which is rather than get more and more humiliated by life he actually sticks to his guns and like builds up a life Whoa. and kind of doesn't take humiliation as an excuse to flee from the truth. He takes humiliation mm-hmm. as an excuse to improve his actual real world situation. And so we Double see that happen. Do better. Yeah. And doesn't really doesn't really throw at everybody's face how right he was. Yeah. No. I mean, he could have done a lot more, but that's <laughs> Just another he gets his knock knock. <laughs> that's another reason why you get Tom Hanks, you know. We talked a lot about right. Leo, but the Tom Hanks of it all is um, you know, the do gooding, the relentless but with a smile you know and it's it never has that um peacock walk around look what i Mm-mm. did scene in any of his roles that i can think of because for the most part the perception doesn't matter to him like even the, it, the the part of what i think is very effective about this movie is the messages of the micro are the same as the messages of the macro so like we were just talking about that guy looking around the room 
uh, the whole reason he does that is he wants to be perceived as in control and understanding mm. what's going on, and he wants to be seen as smart and still powerful. But that's its own con, because he doesn't understand what's going on, and talking about it makes him feel small. And so he tries to con everybody in the room into thinking that he understands something. And Hanratty just doesn't really care about that. We learn at the end of the movie that he does kind of mess with the truth that he kind of tells himself his daughter's younger than she really is because that helps motivate him but we don't ever see him project that outwards to other people really he doesn't care he wants to just live in the truth it's also the filmmakers and Hank's not doing something extremely dramatic you know it's not like the truth is oh she died in a car accident when she was four and she's frozen like that it's not like there's not something crazy it's just that she just grew up to be 15 and it like all 15 year olds don't have a lot of time for their dad that's the the truest and saddest possible yeah. thing that it could be and then you rely on what hanks was doing not the deus ex machina drama that you know you drop in there for no reason now f- refocusing back on the two of them together one of the main scenes is right about in the middle of the movie and it is in france and they finally they've like danced around each other. They've they've had a lot of phone calls, but now they're Christmas Eve, staring at each other eye to eye. And Leo is the most unhinged. Uh-huh. Yeah, he like Frank has nothing to live for anymore except making as many checks as he can carry in two hands and eat those beans. Uh, and eat those. They're the best French beans. Delicious you, French beans. You know that thing people are always talking about? French beans. I think that's coffee, right? He's just eating coffee yeah. beans. Yeah, the French roast. <laughs> I roasted That's why he beans. is the way he is. Uh, how, how, did that, how does that scene work as the, if this is the heat moment of them eye to eye? I th- another reason this movie really works is because we don't have... Uh, let me pick on two people. Um Walking Phoenix and Jared Leto trying to mm. out Joker, the other Why? one in the scene. You know, <laughs> like they're both two very different characters with two very different uh, sensibilities and personalities. But also, I feel like I don't. I don't think that Leo is even Jared Letoing in the scene. I think that they're both responding to each other. You know, and yes. it's the whole scene feels organic because um, it's it, it feels it has that improvisational feel of like the, this is. The, the middle for these wow. two you know like this is the sort of start and end of their relationship and i i really like is having seen this movie a bunch i like frank also could not know whether i should believe tom hanks or not yeah exactly if if he is there alone or because he plays everything so understated and it seems like the game is everything so why would he show up with a thousand french police officers to ruin their game i think that part's weird though it's kind of have your cake and eat it too because they walk out and he is alone and then uh-huh. the French cops show up. It's it's an odd way to like structure it. I think it's because the, they are both they both get so obsessed with what the truth of the situation is, and they're playing mm. with it so much. And so that moment where what? Abigail is like, "Oh, you did con me. I believed you so much. I can't believe you actually did it." And then he realizes, like, the way those guys come out of the cars, it's not just like there was going to be a lot of French cops. What he tells him is these French cops are agitated and they're going to shoot you on yeah. sight. And man, when those guys come out of the car, they look like they're playing yeah. to they're shoot gonna, him what? Speaking of the man in the iron mask, like these French assholes are going to throw you into an 1800s dungeon. <laughs> like, Yeah, dude. Your hairstyle is going to go back in time. <laughs> I think another that, incredible moment between the two of them um, happens a little bit later than this scene where uh, Frank escapes again and goes to his mom's house where he sees mm. a new sister he didn't know existed. Um, she's now living with James Brolin. And um, just he walks away from the house after the cops get there. And he's like, just get me in the car. Yeah, dude. Hand ready. Just get me in the car. You know, Tom Hanks doesn't even say anything. But Tom Hanks is not like, Frank, get on the ground. Put your hands behind your head. He's just like, yeah, let's let's get back in the car. It's like yeah. it doesn't add anything to the sentence or to the trial or to the arrest it's just this is another speed bump that the two of us are going through in this bonding mission of ours it's it's such a good character moment because at that like get me in the car is like hey you're chasing me and taking away from her freedom but you are my safe haven right now right i can trust you and know what you will do with you're me. predictable you're not gonna break my heart like this yes also and if you think about it, how does the how is the mom breaking his heart she is not living a, a false life she is living her truth and that truth is so destructive to him because the what? truth is she thinks of his father as such a big loser that she fell out of love with him and fell in love with another man who was way more successful and then she did that divorced thing of 
she started another family and that's her real fucking family. Yeah. Like, right. Her real family lives in that house and he's part of the not real family. And she did all that just by embracing what is true for her and just living in reality. And that is like so destructive to him and there's no escape from it because it's just the truth. And and we get because because the movie is so from Frank Jr.'s point of view, maybe she misses him, maybe, but it does feel like he is just collateral damage in the divorce that I, and so it's, it wipes away what his mom ever caring about him in his eyes. I think the movie is clearly showing us, you know, like moms when you separate them from their children, uh, they can get pretty feisty. And so her like complete <laughs> lack of Why? interest or effort in key, in maintaining a relationship, I think says a lot, you know. I mean, living with his dad was the dream. He was a soldier who came and libera- liberated her village and then took her away to, instead of a ruined place, a, a thriving place. That was the dream. The truth was, this guy was actually a big fucking loser. <laughs> and yeah. she had to watch him fritter away everything they had, legally or extra-legally, and then just fell out of love with that whole situation. And so it's like, that. It, it's just, she was living in the fantasy. And then when she came to reality... Um, oops, there goes gravity. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I was trying to think so hard. <laughs> Shit, what does he say next? Um, another Leo moment I love is uh, with his mom is that uh, Leo walks in as James Brolin, her future husband, is coming out of the bedroom. And they're like yeah. putting their clothes back together. And you're not totally sure if it did go down, but it looks like it did. Uh, the next day he comes back and the there's divorce proceedings yes. happening in the bedroom. Right. But a guy walks out of the mom's room again, and Leo's like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Damn, <Wow>. lady. <laughs> What's you going on here? And he just starts to attack the lawyer. Yeah. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> it's not yesterday's situation. With, do you wish we got more? Like, I mean, we got three or four Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan movies. Uh, there's so many Leo Scorsese movies or all his directors. Do we wish we got more of this duo together or because there isn't that extra spark elevating each other? Is it eh. by spark? Do you mean all spark? There's not enough all spark. There's not enough power or responsibility. I got to be honest, Mike. I had never considered that until you just said it. I've never thought like, where's our next Leo Hanks movie? It's just, yeah, this movie's great. Move I'm, on. I'm, I'm good. I think they have very different energies, and I think that they, the energies just don't mix in this. Clearly, he and Brad Pitt, Leo and Brad Pitt, have like very complementary energies, and so you put them on screen together, and it's just you can see you're getting more than the sum of the parts. But it, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't feel like they need like a movie to redeem this one because it's not that bad. First of not, all, not so. redeem, no. But like you know, I, catch me almost, if you can. Just yeah, <laughs> and it's just a giant toucan <laughs> hunting them. <laughs> They're trying to get the Fruit Loops. Um, but yeah, you don't. It, the, the, you certainly don't come out of this hoping to see the two of them paired up again. And I wonder if this is the one point in their both their careers where this could work. Earlier, too similar because Tom Hanks used to pay a rap scallion from time uh-huh. to time, and now they exist in different kinds of movies because uh, Leo is, you know, a, a gray or mostly bad guy in movies where people die. And Tom Hanks is only in Apple TV movies for dads that nobody watches. Was Tom, was Tom Hanks at some point arrested? And like the judge said, you just have to constantly make movies for Apple Plus, and no one is allowed to see them. <laughs> did, did he get in tax? Yeah, you guys. I have thing? seen all of these movies. I saw the movie where he built a robot. I saw the movie where he reads the news, and I saw the movie where he is the, a ship's captain. I have seen all the Tom Hanks. You saw Dog Chappie. I saw Dog <laughs> Chappie, and I will see it again. I saw the one where he reads the news, and it was... He reads the news? Yeah, yeah, the movie news of the day, it. I think it's called, or News of the World. News of the World. Oh, is it the Postman type movie? Yeah. Is that what it is? And that was, like, I think right when everybody was like... It, it was a fine movie. Tom Hanks was great in it, but it's like, do we need all these movies? Like, wh- <laughs> <laughs> why are they making so many movies? Now, I, I miss that time. That was just three years ago, but I miss it so bad because I think we're fucked. Because we've well, got like four movies left. <laughs> yeah. In the old tape. And then no more movies. And they all feature the Allsberg. <laughs> We're going to take the quickest breaks and contemplate the Allspark. And when we come back, play a little game. Taste Buds. I am thrilled to announce that because of all the buzz that this episode is building for Catch Me If You Can, the film. I'm so sorry. Real quick, the episode that we have not released yet. Yes. Okay. The one that There's we're not even pre-buzz. done recording yet. Right. We're, we're in the midst of recording, but the pre-buzz, it's building. Wow, okay. Uh, 
that Spielberg got DreamWorks is making their own amusement park, and there will be a whole land dedicated to Catch Me If You Can. Oh, wow. Catch Me If You Can, the theme park, if you will. So what we're going to do, they do need some help. Uh, They're kind of bereft of ideas. We're going to go through and go back and forth. We're going to talk about rides, menu items, action figures. Uh, So I'll call it a thing, and you guys have to come up with good ideas. Does this make sense? Yes. I don't know if anything's ever made more sense. Hollywood, right or strike, doesn't stop us. (laughs) We're scabs. No, sure. (laughs) All right. So, Greg, you're going to kick us off with what is the quintessential Catch Me If You Can theme park ride? The quintessential theme park ride. I think what it should be is, um, like, there's this ride at at Disneyland now called Rise of the Resistance. And it's, like, as much of... um, Please, I'm not trying to be an asshole. Please don't say anything. I've avoided all spoilers for, like, five years now. Okay. Um Here's what I think the Catch Me If You Can ride should be like. You should it should it should catch it should catch the essence of like constantly slipping away is what I want to mm. do. So um, you should be like apprehended at one point, and then it's almost like an escape room, and then you slip out the side, and then like maybe you hop in a, a car for a little bit, and it like takes you to the airport, and then you have to like sneak onto the plane. So it's like something between a ride and um, an attraction, you know, not just strictly. Whoa. Love that, Ryan. We need more than one ride. What else is there? Uh, Mike, I think that. There is, you're going to go into a room and um, a bunch of information is going to be on a screen. You have to memorize it because when you go into the next room, you're taking the Louisiana bar exam. (laughs) (laughs) You better pass that shit. Frank Abagnale's (laughs) Jambari. All right. Any more rides that are like, of course, this ride has to be here. Well, speaking of Jamborees, I do think there should be one where animatronic, all the animatronic Franks sing old school country song <laughs> and they're bears <laughs> all right so we've got the amusement part down but there is of course in a jam bari restaurants so what, what what is a themed restaurant menu item greg let's see what what res, what restaurant item do we absolutely need to have this oh you know what it's got to be uh it's got to be they serve you a salad with you might think this is a cold fork no, it's a chilled <laughs> fork, you fucking rube. A cold <laughs> fork? I've never even heard of that sort of language before. I guess you've never eaten at a fancy place before. It's not cold, Dad. It's chilled. So a salad with a chilled, not cold, fork. I love that. But also, was his dad about to ask for a new fork that was yeah. less cold? Because uh, that was the vibe. Can you hot this fork up for me? <laughs> <laughs> Throw it in the microwave. There's Always a couple a instances where clearly Spielberg cut out a couple lines of dialogue that aren't totally necessary for understanding the mood, but kind of are under- necessary for understanding how the characters got to where they were going. But yeah, clearly there is something more about the fork that's on the cutting room floor. And so the lines as they stand are, this is a chilled fork. And then, no, dad, it's a cold fork. I fucking hate you. Here's your Cadillac. All right, so cold fork salad, or chilled fork salad. And Ryan, what else? Uh, At that same restaurant, you can, of course, buy the Frankfurter Abagnale Jr. Uh, On top of that, you can have some ketchup if, you if, if, if me, if you can, <laughs> <laughs> and a catch me if you can of cola. <laughs> we appreciate effort here, don't we, folks? <laughs> and I imagine uh, all the servers are dressed like what they used to call stewardesses of the time. Yes, I also yeah. think it's kind of a gross, like Hooters and, tilted kilt vibe. And all and meals like, come with uh, a little Jennifer garnish. <laughs> <laughs> I think another restaurant slash attraction would be um, Frank and. What's her name's wedding? Brenda. Brenda's wedding. Brenda Strong. Yeah, just like I, I don't know, like that Tony and Tina thing where everybody that went to the play were just guests of this Italian wedding. Right. I think more places should do that. I just want to go to a wedding. Uh, it also reminds me. And of it's wow. like southern and mint julepy vibe. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, all of the Louisiana food. It also reminds me of that place at Itchy and Scratchy Land where it's uh, New Year's every hour on the hour. Yes. <laughs> so you just count it down the entire time. But to, to get out of the restaurant, you do have to go into the house, second story window, climb out of the window. Well, yeah. money, like as a kid, when you sold the most magazines, you got to stand in the money booth. Yes. Oh, so yeah. you, you do, as you're sliding out the window, you have to grab the dollar bills flashing around. 
That we could do that too. Um, if we do the printing press, that's a restaurant, and it's just instead of mm. checks, it's like French fries, and you just have to catch them <laughs> if you can. If you wow. now, all right, we're full. We've ridden some rides. We need to fill these gift shops. So, what kind of accoutrement action figures will be in there? Necklace. Got it. Yeah, necklace. Oh, Got to be pilot shit. wings wow. too. The Pan Am pilot wings. Wow. I'm, is there a special edition? Uh, what's Hagnatty? What's his fucking Hanratty? name? Hanratty. Hanratty. Action figure? In action figure? In action. Just knock, knock. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> okay, you know that's on the t shirts. <laughs> knock, knock. Fuck you. <laughs> Knock knock on the front. Fuck you. On the back. <laughs> uh, I legit laughed. That is one of the best knock knock jokes I've ever heard. <laughs> what? Um, I mean, I guess the competition's not super steep. Um, <laughs> what can we build? Like how Star Wars at Disneyland has the lightsabers. Oh yeah, James Bond I car. Guess, oh, you have to bake G- your own check, right? Like you, like they give you all the components of a check, and they kind of like they give you like a little reference guide for what it rep- mm. roughly should look like and then you go in and doctor your own check yeah your own forgery systems could there be something too where you're like in a mock plane and you have to figure yes. out how to go into the toilet <laughs> <laughs> man Just the true story every time i have to go in the toilet on the plane did we think he was going to do the schindler's list thing there for a second <laughs> Yeah. Like he's just the going shortest Schindler's List because he just gets stuck. Oh my god! Yeah, you could get like one arm down there. I shouldn't have done this. <laughs> Let me out, hand ready. Truce, truce. I think yeah, should, dude. I give up. Should have asked for like six more truces throughout the movie. <laughs> <laughs> he he actually gave up a lot. He's not that tenacious. He is not. Yeah. The, okay. <laughs> you know what toy you definitely get? There's two mice. Oh God! <laughs> and a bowl of butter. When I watched this movie for the second time, anytime someone started telling that story, I fast forward it. I could not <laughs> stand hearing about those fucking mice anymore. Oh, I uh, know. One mouse dies, and they're like, "What a good story!" Is it? Also, <laughs> he's entombed in butter. It, the first time we hear it, Walken is toasting himself at his own awards. <laughs> That's yeah. <fucked> up, <laughs> he he's to me. He somehow tricked a group of people into calling him the man of the year how about this uh at every table at the restaurant is a bucket of butter with like steps <laughs> leading out but also a dead rat <laughs> it's somewhere a in dead there. mouse in the bottom of it not supposed to be there that's not a food violation <laughs> all right we have our our the things we're selling we have our rides we have our menu what clearly there's going to be a stage show <laughs> what are some of the musical numbers from Catch Me If You Can. Maybe maybe there's a Groove 66 sprinkled throughout the amusement park. If For those of you who have been to Southern California's Disney's California Adventure, you'll know that reference. I think I think there should be like a Pan Am I the One You're Looking For? Um, maybe what? like him dressed as a pilot with like the eight like temporary stewardesses that he like... He- he ruined these eight women's lives. Yes. Yeah. He got them to drop out of college for a fake program. Well, I think that they, you know, he it all kind of gets set up with the very first thing that he his like first con again in response to humiliation is being humiliated by kids in his class. So he pretends to be the substitute teacher. Yeah. When that old lady walks in, I'm not that old, but I'm kind of an old person now. My folks are old, and so I know what it's like for them to like get ready and go out into the world. <laughs> I, like he did not give a shit that he ruined that what? lady's whole day. And that's a, like kind of a little peek into the fact that he didn't care really that there was this collateral damage, and those women are another good example of that. I mean, his wife Brenda Strong is kind of an example of that. Mm. She sort of, I could just be misremembering, but I feel like she kind of like disappears from the movie and is not really. It's clear that she leaves him, that they break up, but like, what becomes of their relationship? We'll we'll talk about. We'll get that there, Mike. Don't different... so you're jumping the gun, Mike. We're still doing the theme park stuff. I want one of the songs at the theme park show to um, be the continuing mutterings of that substitute. Motherfucking (laughs) motherfucking stupid son of a bitch. (laughs) All right. I think, you know what? I I think you guys did a fine job. I think Spielberg and co have a lot of good ideas now and everybody will enjoy next summer. Their first visit to catch me. If you can, this is opening soon. Can I do one more souvenir? Sure. Um, it's like sticks that come out um, in front of you. You know, like devil that sticks. Je- Love that jet. No, definitely not. <laughs> so that. cool. Devil sticks, Greg. As cool as it gets, Ryan. You're totally right. Devil sticks All for the everybody. All cool kids will do devil, devil sticks. Devil sticks, Greg. You know what those? Um, like the Jackson Five. 
Yes. yes. You know, where you're five guys one, like, yeah, you're one of them. But uh, so we do that. But in front of you is always a Frank Abagnale, like three feet in front of you. And so you're just chasing him the entire <laughs> time. I love it. And I can't wait to go here. We're going to take the quicks of breaks. And when we come back, the final official taste bud of movie of the year season 2002. Damn! Taste buds, I ask you this for the final time this season. Are the women in this movie actually women? Or are they just a man's idea of women? Or are they just Frank Abagnale Jr.'s idea of women? Yeah, especially when he, like, whenever he was interacting with a woman who was being sort of, like, bowled over by his act, I felt like it didn't take into consideration the fact that pretty women are constantly being approached by people with ulterior motives and that they it's not so easy to just get one over on them and all of these women were always and i know it's probably from his perspective or whatever so we're not supposed to believe everything we see but it just felt like rather than women who they should have been like uggos <laughs> no but just like if you are honestly if you are a beautiful woman from the time that you're like a very young girl you are used to people kind of being weird to you and like having like having ulterior motives. And I just think that a guy approaching them and having an ulterior motive would be like, okay, I have to manage this situation. And instead they're just like, Oh gee. Oh my. Oh wow. I I think two questions about that Uh, is one. Is it because his ulterior motive is never his first ulterior motive is never to sleep with them. So maybe that is disarming because it's not the vibe that's getting thrown off again at first. The second is, it's the 50s. Everybody's dumb. (laughs) (laughs) It's funny. I didn't know. I didn't put together that between this and 40-Year-Old Virgin that Elizabeth Banks' career used to just be big, loud, dumb laughs. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) That laugh is so (laughs) endearing. Uh, I think that we have to go back to not just Leo's talent, but his looks. I think that in order to, and I'm not totally defending the movie of what you're accusing it of. I think they like you, you're making good points, but in order to pull this off, at, to even have a chance of pulling this off, you must cast the most handsome person uh, that was currently living on the planet at that point. And then it it makes sense that even gorgeous women would be. <laughs> and I do feel like in the universe of the movie, he is understood to be as attractive as Leonardo DiCaprio. The actor it's is to us. A rare movie that acknowledges that their lead is that handsome, yes. And in fact, when he's going through the bank to pick who he's going to, fir- like when he f- runs into, what's her name, Elizabeth Banks? Banks, yeah. When, when he, if you like watch the women he doesn't approach, I think it's because he's like, I need to get one who is kind of equal to how attractive I am. Otherwise, she will see me coming because she'll be like, Whoa. why are you approaching me? Which is kind of a gross thing to say, but I think that's his his thinking behind it. And so it does. The movie heavily acknowledges that, like, to even be in the presence of of a man this attractive, like, even heterosexual men are disarmed because mm-hmm. he's such a good looking person. Well, I think the, the, the first other... bank teller that doesn't work on, and he is clumsy and doesn't move it, but she is not movie attractive like it's very purposely yes. so it does feel like you're trying to manipulate me fuck off i don't think it's the attractiveness though as much as the age and experience i think that yeah. in the beginning oh, when okay. he's fumbling that Whoa. older women you know they're it's not that they're not attracted to them it's like i've seen your shit before bro like yes. i i know what's exactly happening and i know but... that you're not supposed Whoa. to just take somebody back behind the counter and start explaining right. to them how checks are processed but Whoa. i think that these girls are essentially his age like very new to the world and therefore easier to manipulate like could there have been more i don't know um reflection or uh Whoa. you know a, a being apologetic about destroying all these women's lives. But like the only way that that stewardess thing is going to work is if you get the youngest possible girls to do it, you know, right. anybody over the age of 25 would have been like, what the fuck? Fuck you. And in a world where pilots are stars to the point that you want a random anonymous nameless pilot to sign you an autograph that just says pilot. Do you, <laughs> do you guys remember that part of history? Was this ever in our lives where pilots were fucking rock stars? I- I remember pre nine, you did get to because I was often an unaccompanied minor, uh, <laughs> flying across the country alone. Uh, I would always get to hang out in the cockpit for a while and shoot the shit, and then get a little pin. But I do think, like in the late sixties, early seventies, they were considered like, yeah, just like movie James stars. Bond. 
and even the even the flight attendants were like you know they were the most glamorous women and, and so that was like it was like celebrity status and that and that's probably another thing that he uses to sort of bedazzle people but i i and i have to say the movie it does acknowledge um that women are more complex than a lot of times men view them as because he thinks through the entire beginning of his relationship with Brenda Strong that she's the most naive, silly, stupid person falling for all this stuff. He loves her, but he thinks that she's just naive and innocent. And then when she's crying, when they're going to be intimate together, he thinks it's because she's afraid to lose her virginity. And she's like, no, dude, actually, I kind of have this whole backstory that you don't know about and it's nothing like the innocent version of me. That and, like, never, you ne- and you never bothered to ask. And right. he never bothered to ask. Yeah. And so the truth is I'm alienated from my family. I have had sex already. I've been through this terrible experience. And like, I have way more to me than you are seeing. And honestly, he doesn't flee from that. Instead, he's like, okay, I will bind myself closer to you. I will help fix your life. I will repair what's broken in your life that mirrors what's broken in my what? own life. And in that way, it kind of, he deals with her. He, like, falls in love with a complex version of her, not the simple version of her. To a point, yeah, and then it is definitely, there's some of, like, I uh, I see parallels, you and me fall in love more, uh, but he still, he still just leaves her. Like, and, and, like, and I what, know what, she, what like, happens gets with, with the FBI, yes, but, okay, and yeah. that's when he cuts and runs. He's like, yes. oh, then never mind. Yeah, I mean, like, he, he susses out that she's on the take or whatever you say about that. Because she's standing there crying because she... Has like is in the process of like turning on him, not betraying him. But. And I think that the movie is sort of that scene is sort of shot in a way where we might be focusing on Frank's paranoia until mm. it doesn't care about that anymore, and it's very very clear what Brenda's wow. doing and what what is happening at the airport. However, when he leaves with all that money, um, I believe he wants her to go. I believe yes. that like I didn't just use you to get to this point, and now you're trash to me, and I'm out. Like I think that they. Think, he thinks that they belong together. Yes, but I, he's I the, the difference he, is he money at this point is the most important thing because it's more dependable than families. And she's like, "Well, you got me back in with my family, so I can't leave them again. I just got them back." And he does not get that. She's also rich. And yeah, she, I mean, she's been and she's been put like Mike said, like he has restored her to what she lost, and she's not going to lose it again like the same way that he doesn't want to lose his relationship with his father or his mother she doesn't want to lose that relationship again if i had sex and needed an abortion and then you won't speak to any more me anymore because i'm a broken woman fuck you forever like i don't want that repaired yeah i mean i and i agree with that too but it's always hard when we're talking about our parents you know it's very hard to we a lot of people should just say fuck you to their parents but like most of the messages in culture, most of the, the things we're brought up to believe is like, nah, you kind of have to accept mom and dad and no matter what. It's really hard to say fuck you to Martin Sheen. I mean. Dude, and he's good in this, wow. man. Everyone who appears even for a little bit in this movie, I feel like is really like delivering. I, th- I feel like that's one of the things that's gone away. Um, and all these changes with movies. But like in our day, you would start a movie and the opening credits would come on and you'd recognize the first 12 actors in the opening right. credits. You just fill that cast with people. And now... You just it's fill a it with Chris Spider Man names. Yeah, <laughs> fucking Spider Man. Speed round for the final time this season. <laughs> Taste buds, why start with the game show framing that transitioned into I'm in prison framing into a flashback? Is there a point to that, or is it just a lot of throat clearing the movie could have get, done away with? In a movie it's that, like a, in a movie that's like really watchable and entertaining and just pops it's an oddly confusing way to start things i think it's to remind you this is all bullshit like what we're going to show you is a movie where someone tries to navigate between truth and bullshit but the story it's based on is bullshit this is lie after lie after lie after lie so let's give you a couple layers of artifice to remind you that this movie is just some bullshit or bullshit at the end of the day Man, we didn't even get to in the first segment about how this is so clearly Spielberg's like um, imposter syndrome coming through as him like a storyteller and yeah, like I'm not a real director. I'm not a real director. <laughs> and like what what store what do I owe the audience and what do they owe me? And like um, am I clearly running from something in my life by going from movie to movie to movie, <laughs> character to character? Like and should I like 
should I lie to protect my parents or should I like finally what? like face the truth? Because I mean, Fablement is him being like, face okay, everybody, up. this this is what happened. Like, this is the story. But yeah, it took him till he was seventy to <laughs> finally do that. Does it ruin the movie, or is it somehow perfect that so much of Frank Frank Abagnale's story? From his book, as portrayed in the movie, is itself a scam and not real, including most of the film's central details. Yeah, I, I wondered if we would talk about this because I'm not as sure in the end of the, at the end of the day how much it really matters. But none of this is like based on a true story at all. It's it's a lie after a lie after a lie after a lie. If some of the details in this are like so amazing, like somebody who lies all the time would come up with them, it's because that's exactly what happened. <laughs> all of this stuff is BS, and it sounds like BS. And so in that way, I and think And then it makes... the girl who was the biggest model at the time? <laughs> yeah. She wanted to fuck me? <laughs> Which also, like... Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit, that scene. But um, I, I do think very much it is it makes the movie kind of better because, like, that's what it's about, right? There's no truth here. It has no abs- kernel of truth. What? I don't want to get, like, too, you know, undergrad, let's sit in a classroom discussing things. Although, literally what we're doing right now. But, like, it, it makes it so much better. I wouldn't... I'm not saying that I prefer it, but... Just as a think piece, you know, as like uh, trying to dis- dissect what matters and what doesn't, it's amazing. And like the people who complain about it are like, well, then that movie's fucking fake and bullshit. Now I'm going to go watch Minions. Like, that's <laughs> honestly what, a lot of that is made up too, folks. No, but what do you think storytelling is? Somebody did one day put an aspirin in overalls. So <laughs> it is based on a true story. I, and I think that's when it's like, when the movie is, when it's a biopic, and I guess that the truthiness of it matters to me because it's like, well, you're just saying, here's the story of this person. And especially because those movies so often aren't caring about being a good movie or telling a story. They're just saying, here's a fact and here's a fact. And then they did this and here's a fact. And so when it's actually telling a story like this or JFK, uh, that doesn't matter as much to me because you're just being like, truth is crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, yep. that's those are, that, those are two amazing examples because they're about truth and, mm-hmm. you know, like, what is truth while trying to tell a quote unquote true story. So yeah, that's perfect. But also the being an expert on check cashing, not real. The pilot thing, not real. The being a doctor thing for a while, not real. Like it's all the central parts that make this movie kind of charming are just they're lies told by a liar. Like mm-hmm. it's so weird that it, that would be surprising in any way. Does this movie at its core, just show that both Frank and Carl are weirdos in their world, so of course they always had to find each other. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot to that. They're they're both outcasts, and they're both they both get humiliated by other people. And it, it's the movie is about how do you handle when you're being humiliated? Can you can you sit with it, or do you need what? to construct a fantasy to pull yourself away from it? I think it's about two guys who in different ways but sort of think the same thing of like i don't need anybody else you know like Mm. uh i don't loneliness is never going to be a problem for me not that i'm always gonna have people but like i'll never get lonely i will be alone and i'll never get lonely and it's just it's simply not true and i i think that a lot of times we have stories about people who um think they'll never be lonely and are lonely and then we'll go on killing sprees right but this movie is just a little more simple than that and it's just like oh here's two lonely people that found each other we talked a lot about how spielberg relates to family and parenthood in general in his movies but what is this movie saying about fatherhood yeah i mean we talked a lot about this but like um that the role of a father is so much more nebulous than a mom in real life and in movies and like there's so many more dads that dip than moms and there's so many dads that like don't change their lives than moms you know and but th- as a kid you, that's the only dad you know and so like we were talking about before that's that's the sunlight that you grow towards even if it's not growing towards a great place and i think we watched that, that with the abignails and then like what you do becomes what your kids do he grows what? up with one version of his father and he kind of becomes that version of his father but what he he doesn't seem to realize is the version of his father that exists after they separate just becomes a hard worker who's willing to do what it takes <laughs> you know he becomes a post office worker he won't accept the cadillac he realizes he has to face the reality of his life and he does but he's kind of already ruined his son by just acting the way he acted when his son was growing up and so it's like he becomes that old version of himself and 
Frank Jr. never realizes, wait, I should become the person he is now, not the person he was when I grew up with him. He's also like, he's like weirdly out of it as the movie progresses. Like, not dementia, and it's not necessarily alcoholism, but there's something off about. He's broken. Walking in that, yeah, it's just that like, he's sort of, well, this is my life, I guess. Fuck. And then like, it's almost like he, he can't see Frank anymore for the person that he is. And I think that there's a tie in here that I'm not sure that the movie handled perfectly with Frank walking around the office of the FBI that looks like fucking Scranton, right? It looks like <laughs> that Michael Scott, they're just selling paper there and just being like, fuck, you know? Like, yeah. this is it. And what you're doing is supposed to be more noble than all the crimes you were committing, right? It's supposed to like give you a good feeling to make you sleep at night, but you're still, you're still that cog, as Greg said. Is Spielberg and his infinite Spielberganism tackling class in an interesting way? Yeah, I mean, all this is like they they want to be rich, they see money as power, and they're also stuck, you know, like they're going to be stuck in that butter forever if they follow the rules. And And like wow. the real wealth in this country that we, the story we tell ourselves sometimes over and over and over again is the mouse that won't stop until he walks out on butter. And that's the American myth because the truth is it's like the family from Louisiana. It's the strongs. They have had money forever. And that's who is going to end up with money. Not these people who hustle, the hustling gets taken care of in a lot of different ways. And one of them is that the like police state comes and takes you away because if you're rich, your crimes exist a long time ago, as First Cow tells us, right? If you have money, there, there is a crime at the root of it, but it's in, it's in the distant past. If you want money now, your crime is going to be in the present, and then you're going to get in trouble for that. And what? so I think it's like the class thing is you get away with the crimes of your ancestors, but you can't get away with your own crimes, even if they amount to similar things. I wonder how the Strongs did make all that money in that plantation-ass looking in house Louisiana? in Louisiana. Yeah. <laughs> How, how did they come about all that? How did a bunch of Louisiana Lutherans <laughs> make a whole bunch of money? You sound like you're narrating a reality show. <laughs> we took 25 crazy Louisiana Lutherans. How would this movie have been different if it was directed by Steven's non-union Mexican equivalent, Esteban Spielbergo? The same. Such a valid I, question. I, I think it would have absolutely been the same. <laughs> I'm guessing Roma? It would have been the movie Roma. Roma. Would this movie have been better if one of Frank Abagnale's profession was a dead rabbit in the slums of 1846 New York? <laughs> no, I think we know it would have been worse at this point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for this particular group of guys. Having done two podcasts about this question, it would have been worse. And finally, and this is pro possibly the most hard-hitting question we've asked all night. Of all the 2002 babes in this movie, which one was missing the most, and why is it Nani from Lilo and Stitch? <laughs> <laughs> would you have cast a real person or just drawn her in? Drawn her in. Yeah. I've recently seen a movie that does a pretty good job at mixing mediums. Oh, really? Across the Spider Verse. <laughs> and uh, I think just draw her in. Yeah, 2002 dude. needed a cool world. And it could have been <laughs> Catch Me If You Can. Also, what real woman could live up to the beauty standard set by her? <laughs> None. None. Zero. Zip. That is all the time we have for Spit Round. We're going to take the quick breaks. And when we come back, the final award season of 2002. Taste Buds. It is the final award season of the season. And can you believe that Catch Me If You Can was nominated for some uh, Academy Awards? Mm. Yeah, like some. There's Thanks, like Research couple. Department. Is this the last time you tell us it's the last time of something for the season? It is not. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I'm looking at my notes. It is not. But you know what? Excellent question, Ryan. We're going to start off with the first and last time we give out the award for Best Escape. Greg. Okay. I'm going to say the best escape is how he escapes from his parents' divorce. I think there is mm. nothing more that 2002 kids needed to see than someone who says, Mom, Dad, I understand you're getting a divorce, and I understand I have to choose one of you over the other one, and I choose to run away and become a pretend <laughs> pilot. So his Whoa. first initial escape when he runs away from their divorce, which I think he basically spends the rest of the movie trying to escape until he realizes that his mom is happy with her second family. Who the fuck? God, that sounds so familiar. That sounds so, th that had to have happened with somebody else. Running from divorce? Yeah, and just not being happy, not accepting your mom until way later in her new life. 
Is, is it, it Esteban Spielberg? Is it non-union filmmaker <laughs> Esteban Spielberg? I think it is. I mean, yeah, that's the that's the whole thing, right? Like he he kind of like secretly made the Fablemans before he made the Fablemans, yeah. but we just didn't know because we didn't have the Fablemans yet. And it, 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 it's so fucked up. Uh, throughout like the whole second act of the movie, he makes it very clear to Christopher Walken multiple times that I'm doing this so we can get the family together. Yes, and yes. Walken knows he hasn't seen her in years. Uh, she's married now, and he's just like, "Well, I guess do that, sure." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, has she seen you in this? Don't let her see you in this uniform. Uh, y- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's up. The issue would that be. would probably change her mind. Sure. <laughs> uh, Ryan, what is your best escape? I think there's a clear winner for best escape, but I'm gonna go instead of like most successful and most dope. Uh, I'm gonna go with favorite, which is while in the French prison hospital and you guys looked <laughs> away for two seconds. I just snuck out the door, even though I, there's nowhere to go. Yeah. I can't walk. And you guys will slowly walk as a group <laughs> next to me. You got to give it up for this guy's spirit. Like, and the other prisoners are fucking <laughs> yeah, standing ovation, cheering him on. When he disappears, you're like, oh, he was pretending to be sick. I get it. And then yeah. they cut to him like 20 feet away, just coughing up a lung. Like, oh no, that dude's really sick. All the prisoners just in celebration, just launching jizz all over the floor <laughs> from their hand, just throwing jizz everywhere. Mix, mix, mix. <laughs> I like how there's like maybe two countries in the whole world where being in their prison system would be like, okay. It's like Norway and Sweden or yeah. something like, like so, the two oh, places. God. I got imprisoned in Norway. I can eat <laughs> more than French beans. Because clearly in France, they just throw you into a small room until you die. Mm-hmm. French, the French invented the oubliette, right? And that was just like a pit they throw you. This is, I'm mostly getting this from Labyrinth. Like uh, a, yeah, like a, a little cage they just leave you in until you're a yeah. skeleton. <laughs> so it makes sense that they still do that. Wait, did the French invent tiny little people who ride around on dogs? Yes. Okay. Did they invent that it looks like there's a huge wall coming at you, but it's actually just two little dudes on bicycles behind it powering they it? They did invent that as well. Damn. <laughs> they were crazy. <laughs> did they invent giant cod pieces? The French invented gotta, that thing where when you take a sip of a beverage, you hold your pinky up. And what what was the point of that? It's to I show your fancy. Two little guys on a bike and just fanciness. Yeah, it's to show you fancy. Yeah. Well, back in the day, people would carry around little rings, and when that happened, you had to throw the rings onto the pinky, and then you got the prize. <laughs> mm. It's a game and a tea time. You guys don't know a ton about history, do you? Like, I know. <laughs> I'm always explaining things. To you. Listen to a podcast, <laughs> Jesus. They're like five hours long. Dan Carlin. <laughs> edit more oh for some reason in the podcast game if it's about history you just get to make it uh, however long yeah. you fucking want no well stops. they don't have greg on their show <laughs> <laughs> he's like hurry this up i'm sleepy this is too long i gotta go to bed <laughs> what? all right best accent ryan i don't love that i'm picking this but i'm just i have to go with my heart and the warmth that it fills me i go with martin sheen and the Louisiana style. Uh, I We talked about what a despicable person his family is, and him, because of his treatment of his daughter. But I think that he gets away with so much of it because, one, he's Martin Sheen, and two, he's just got that Louisiana upper <laughs> upper class. He does not sound like Gambit, right? Yeah, I'm going with him. That's a good one. What do you got, Greg? I couldn't tell if this actually meant best or meant worst. And I think either way, it's Tom Hanks doing the Boston accent. The Massachusetts. Oh, that's supposed to be Boston? I think so. I thought I was it was like some New England state I've never heard Bastin. of. <laughs> Boston. I think it was Dutch. I think this is supposed to be the father of <laughs> the Elvis's. He, he was right. <laughs> um, but it was like the accent itself is deplorable and gross and awful. You mean um, even like when it's done well? Like, yes, exactly. Like the, the better, the better <laughs> it's done, the worse <laughs> it is. And so uh, his version is, I think, like at first I thought it was a bad one, but I think it's actually pretty good. Um, but also it's terrible. And so just to cover all my bases, I went with Tom Hanks. You know what? <laughs> it's it's the one that makes you want to chew on it the most. Yes. And he just he's an actor who can't do accents. He should probably stop trying. Man, almost any time he does an accent, it totally takes you out of the movie. Just the guy <laughs> himself, you're like totally drawn in. He does an accent, and you spend the whole time being like, "Why is Tom Hanks doing this accent?" He did Big's accent really well. That you know what? He nailed Big. <laughs> he did nail Big. Did this at all feel kind of like a weird spiritual successor to Big? 
if you think of like <laughs> how young Leonardo, like how young Frank Abengale is shown to be, like he's addicted to comics. When they are in his room, there's just candy and potato chips on the ground yeah. because he's like a child. I, I felt thought, like this was kind of like playing on some big vibes. The biggest big change vibes. between 2023 big, big and the 60s or whenever this is, is Tom Hanks finds out that he's a comic book reader and he's like, oh, he's a child. <laughs> yes, and now, yes. no, that means he's 45 years uh, old. He's a 45 year old man. <laughs> He uh, uh, spends his time reading comics like adults are, uh, tend to do. Cringiest moment, Greg. Okay. I'm going to be Greg about this because this might be my last chance to be so. so. This is the last cringiest moment. He and Jennifer Garner enter into a contract whereby she will render consent to have sex with her, provided he pays her 1000 US dollars. He then tricks her into actually having her pay him 400 US dollars, rendering the consent which she's given void because you can't trick what? somebody into consenting to have sex with you even if you're paying them. She's a working girl. She told you what her price was. It was $1,000. If you would like to have sex with this woman, it will cost you $1,000. If you defraud her, you're defrauding her of the consent to have sex with you, which is called something else. So uh, that is my cringiest moment. <laughs> That, I, I like how you went full lawyer mode on that. <laughs> uh, what what about, I don't know if this is the point in the movie where his checks are just working, and so he's only defrauding the government, so does that help if she does get... The way that... No, his plan, his plan is not to go cash the check, because he has right. the check that he could just give her. His plan is... To, to actually rip her off of the money. Mm. And in 2002, we're supposed to go, I read about something like this in Maxim scam. Magazine. This reminds me of a Carl's Jr. commercial. I'm excited. <laughs> uh, but in 2023, what? it's like, wait a minute. Hang on. Sex work is work. It's wrong to steal from a worker. It's wrong to have sex with someone who gives you consent under uh, you know false pretenses. It's not cute in the way that it was intended to be cute, I don't think. It's also interesting too because um, it's this is like this is how rich people work is that he is literally printing money, right? Like he has as much money as he could ever want, and yet if I don't give you this check, I get to keep the check. I have infinite money, but I don't want to give you any of it anyway wow. because it's I have it will keep like I'll have more money, more power, and more fun. I'll just have and more I think. Fun. I'll, that's, I think it, also our hero can't pay for sex. I think that mm, like we can't abide a hero who would. That's some Esteban shit right there. But we can, <laughs> like, cheer for a hero who will steal it because that's what he's steal doing for here. Sex. Yeah. So, I Man. just I threw this whole scene down, what? which means I'm going to lose the point because Mike gives points for specificity. But the whole scene from top to bottom is just, or like set piece or segment or whatever you want to call it, just flawed. Just fucked from the get-go um it's i would put it in the jennifer garner segment of this movie i would put in among spielberg's worst things ever it's so confused not just confusing but confused it has no idea how to set the tone and spielberg talks a lot of shit about how he he doesn't think that he's funny you know he's not like a natural comedian or comedic filmmaker and i i I, his movies have their moments. Like he's not completely adept when it comes to sex. He's completely inept. He's yeah, completely yes. inept. And the sexiness that is attempted in this scene, um, the we don't know if Jennifer Garner is a model or a sex worker or if Leonardo DiCaprio is uh, experienced or skilled or nervous. Like it's all just thrown in here, and the tones are wow. all over the place. It's not connected to any other part of the movie. It's like an interlude in the middle of the movie. And I don't know if this is... So the reading is she got cast because he saw Alias and she's like, she's great. She needs to be in this movie and approached her. But I don't know if that means he then wrote the scene so she could be in it or they had the scene anyway and he went, well, clearly it's this person. But more confusing... Or not all of that's very confusing. At a certain point, he, she was like, oh, no bank's going to be open at 3 a.m. Or they won't cut like... Wait, your thousand dollar night starts at three a.m. Because I'm a sleepy boy by then. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> well, Is it I, just like what do we mean when we say night? Like yeah. how long does night go? And like what do we get up to in the night? I'm just like let's Have let's, let's lay down some parameters for hours. Or did they meet at three in the morning? How much of this time will I be crying? <laughs> uh, 
At least it's bullshit. At least least it's not a real story. Like, at least it's a fake thing that never happened. And And this is like a liar's lie, right? I swear to God, the hooker paid me, right? Cover magazine. Oh, my God, yes. Ugh. Pound for pound performance, Ryan. Uh sometimes and i think we dance around this all night but um sometimes when an actor makes eight movies a year you can just sort of forget how great they are how great they're capable of being um you almost just sort of like start ignoring them like you can't see them anymore because you see them so often Mm. christopher walken will give us an incredible performance every decade or so which sounds like i'm talking shit most people don't do that him in this movie is an absolute like I, I like you. I, you don't think of him as the same actor, you know. He's got like maybe eight banner scenes, and what he's doing on multiple levels of this wow. loving but selfish person, you know, this person who is a dreamer, but a dreamer in all the worst ways, in all the ways that like sort of defeat you, defeat your family, you know. He's eccentric, and so we love him, but also like that's what's killing us. Um, I think that there is, if, if we're giving this 2002 bro energy, there's a real easy way to just blame the mother, you know, like she mm-hmm. couldn't, um, you know, she's like a slut or, uh, she had to ruin this family or she just wanted, she was a gold digger. But if you watch this through just watching Walken and what he's capable of to the people around him, you know, like everyone should have gotten the fuck away from him as fast as possible. Wow. Just the sad eyes and the 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 loser charm like that he he talks this big game but he's so clearly he's a loser to everyone but his son yes until he says you go into tahiti hawaii and then even in his son's eyes i that's Greg. that is a great option and i was torn between him or this other actor and so i'll go with her amy adams at first like Leo was playing a kid who was like an advanced kid, and so it was hard. It was hard to remember how old he was supposed to be. Amy Adams, every time like there's like a, not an establishing shot, but every time you first see her in the shot, you can tell exactly what age she is supposed to be. She's like essentially a child at first. She's a candy striper, uh, and all her mannerisms are the mannerisms of a child. But then we see her <laughs> become more complicated, and then we kind of see that back off because she goes back around her parents, and our parents have a way <laughs> of pushing us right back into the youngest versions of ourselves. Um, we can see that she's intelligent. We can see that she is actively managing Frank, but trying to do so in a way that he's not aware of. Um, and we see her ultimately like sort of have her heart broken by what transpires. And that scene, it's uncomfortable, I think, because it just got an uncomfortable energy, but where she climbs onto her dad's lap to wa- to sing that weird Irish song, <laughs> like watching her realize, oh my God, he's like inviting me back into mm-hmm. his embrace. And then like accept that and then be so bowled over by it. Um, I just thought that like this is why the pound for pound exists because she's in the movie so little, but she's doing so much. And she's honestly, in a way, kind of saving the movie because she's a reminder that the movie is constructing at least one or two three dimensional ladies as well as just dudes. I think that you could like whole not to keep talking shit. That's a beat a dead horse. But I think you can like whole cloth cut the Jennifer Garner stuff from the movie right. and be fine. Um, and then what happens is that you have this character who, like, we don't see him hook up with a lot of girls, but we just know. We just have this feeling, you know? And that's perfect. But what Amy Adams brings to be, like, the the one of the the harem that has a voice, I think, is so important. Like, she is... All of these girls are great, you know? Like, and they're all about to become stars. Right. It's crazy. But nobody is bringing more, like, gravity to their role when... Mm-hmm. Um, Tom Hanks walks into the room and sees the open window, which, first of all, before that, let's talk a little bit of science. A, a, a hundred dollar <laughs> bill floated under the crack of the door and then out towards Tom Hanks' face. I don't think so. But <laughs> he turns around and looks at Amy Adams and her wow. face right there of like, I don't know if I'm in trouble. I don't know if I'm broken hearted. I don't know what happens to me and my family. Like, it's mm. an incredible. Uh, scene with no dialogue you know what's another good one ryan the one where she wants to show him that she's gotten her braces off and as soon as she shows him that they have like the intense energy and then they start kissing and then it's like dr connors 
And she's like, don't you have to go? And he's like, no, nah, I never respond to any of this stuff. Yeah. And then the way she pushes him back with her foot. With her and foot, like, yes. But oh, don't you yeah. have to go? Because she's the only one that's really good at being like, no, this is what you have to do, man. Like, yes, I am doe-eyed when I look at you. But also, I understand that you have something you have to do. And I'm telling you, go do it right now. We're not going to do this fun thing. You have to go do work. And that, like, <laughs> encapsulates the in- entirety of what makes her an interesting, complex character in this. Did you hear when we said pushes her him back with her foot did you hear the noise that mike made <laughs> <laughs> wow. that was a lot I, we gonna just move I on thought we were going to just glide over that ryan uh greg i'm so proud of you for not choosing the star for the first time and last time this season uh, i think i this is the <laughs> only time i did it and amy amy adams is phenomenal and she's great and great argued but christopher walken what? damn it that was the wrong one <laughs> It's what he does is that as like it's easy to forget that the Hessian can also act his balls off. Speaking of Amy Adams, Amy Acker is in this movie, and their names are similar. Mm. Their names are similar. Director's signature moment, Ryan. Um, there's there's some Spielberg is fuck things in here that um, you know I don't want to like I don't want to just list stuff off. I don't want to take anything from Greg, but. None of it hit me as much as in other Spielberg movies that we've done, like Jaws and AI, which are, I think, so pitch perfectly Spielberg. Um, I think with the camera and how it moves, right, and how it's lit, how it's shot and how it's lit, AI and Jaws are it. But with this, I'm going to go more thematic, you know, and we've we've talked about it the entire show. But um, that's uh, if I need to pick a scene, I will pick the one where he's looking in the window, looking at his mom, looking at the sister that he'll probably never meet, and then says, hand ready, get me out of here. Um, this ability to break hearts that we give parents, you know, like wow. we put ourselves in this position where they can absolutely destroy us, hoping that they don't. Um, and we talked about how it happens with Amy Adams' character, and it's so clear, like, I, I, there's no way that I would have said this after or if I had not seen the Fablemans, you know, but like, right. as I, Greg said before, this is Fablemans, uh, you know, 1.0. Greg, <laughs> Gregory. I'm going to go with kind of a shout out to Fablemans uh, as well. Um, and, but also, funny enough, AI, because uh, Spielberg loved, especially at this time, he loved these big shafts of light. Um, and yeah. now I can see like over his career how he did that. But there was, there was a 2002 quality to the lighting of this movie and of the, the movies around this, this era. Uh, and so I'm going to go with right after Frankie catches his mom cheating um, with, the, with the dude. Is this the uh, kitchen? She comes out and she goes into the kitchen, which is in the background. It's a very nice framed shot. He's in the foreground. We have most of the apartment in the foreground. It's kind of a wide shot considering it's such a small apartment. And so it kind of like adds scope to the apartment. Her being in the background really does as well. Uh, And she's standing in this shaft of light. And usually the the light is like a beautiful, wonderful thing. But just like in Fablements, like the light is so harsh in this. And it is like both characters are writhing under it like actively like just being nuked by this light because (laughs) they both know what they know and they 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 have seen what they've seen and there's no going back and so the light is like overwhelming um and it's just how noticeable and what a big presence it is in the scene reminded me so much of Fablements where he has just seen his mom on tape. And so he knows exactly what's going on and there's all that light pouring in and everything. And the way that normally that should be like philosophically a shaft of light is always like (laughs) the best thing. But Spielberg shows us how like, okay, this is a movie about truth and here's two characters agonizing because they're sitting in the truth together, but kind of separate because they can't even look at each other. What's crazy about that light, too, is... And I, I think this is the bluest blue Whoa. light in the movie. You know, blue light... Uh, Spielberg blue light is something that we've talked about on 10 episodes of this podcast. Like Probably one of our most talked about topics, actually. Yeah. And But what's amazing in this scene is that this is Spielberg in 2002. You know, this is... He's been directing movies for, like, 30 years or whatever it is. He has created his own filmic language. You know, whether you know it or not, people know what the blue light means in a Spielberg movie. You know, like he knows that he has trained his audience well enough. And um, the, the, the severe lack of truth in this movie, 
you know, and that it's like highlighted with a light like that. And also it's, it's coming from the outside where she's about to go. She's about to leave the apartment and never come back. You know, it's like follow the light. It's calling to her. It's, yeah. And then it's interesting because then later when he's outside the window looking in, he's in the dark mm-hmm. and like she's in the light until the cars pull up. And then he like goes towards that light. It's But the light in the kitchen is so much colder and the light from the her future house is so much warmer, you know? Yeah. Uh, but neither be chose the floating the dumbass floating dollar from under the door after Frank escapes the engagement party because Steven Spielberg is an amazing director and does so many cool things that you just pointed out. But he also does some dumbass. In case you missed my point, there's magic in the world, but it's not always good magic. Can I throw out a quick dumb one? The just the simple pro- progression of like a couple jets in the tub to like a tub full of yes. jets. Man, first of all, I love a tub full of jets called a jacuzzi usually. Uh, but that is like such a simple thing that Spielberg's so good at. What can I show them that will say so much to them but will only take me one quick second mm-hmm. to show them? And we know exactly like his scam is going so well because now right. the tub is full of the planes. And it's like it. in retrospect, it seems easy, but it's hard to come up with that like f- on the blank page, I think. Yeah, to be like, no, we got to shed five pages of explanation how a scam is going well. How can we do that in one second? Totally. Boom. And John, I'm going to need you to come through and Williams it up with a lot of... <laughs> Dude, was the score good in this or was it a little too much? I felt like it was a little busy and a little in your face. Yeah, I, it was too much. I mean, that's John Williams, but what... Sorry, Mike, go ahead and then I'll talk. I, I was going to say because what the nature of the story is... And it so much is like, and I'm at a bar, and I'm telling you all these great <laughs> adventures I had. It feels like of a piece. Suited to that. Okay, I yeah. like it. So, yeah, I think that they're all going for a thing, and they mostly succeed with the way that he shoots it and the way that William scores it. But the thing that, like, pushes it over the edge into risky greatness is the opening credits. Like, yes, that, just, those credits. that sets you for the mood more than anything else. Yeah, a Pink Panther. Yes, exactly. Uh, speaking of what it reminds you of, this is the final recommendation of the 2002 season. Greg, what do you got? So uh, I really liked the layers of truth and untruth in this, and I found it especially delightful when um, I remembered, because this came out just in like February or March of this year, that this story was like completely exploded by somebody who was just trying to pursue, like just get more details about it. But Frank Abagnale would not talk to them. And so then it came out that none of this is true. And that made me honestly love the movie so much more. And it reminded me of the book by Tim O'Brien, the things they carried. Mm. Um, This is like a autobiography of uh, his time in the Vietnam war. Um, Sometimes he'll admit that parts of it are not real. Sometimes he swears that all of it's real. He's told different versions of all of these stories. Tim O'Brien, the, uh, the actual like publication page, which is always the place where only truth is uh, actually has false details in it saying that he's changed the name of some of the characters, but other characters names are true. Uh, And it's like, it's totally unknowable. Unless you like were in the army with Tim O'Brien, what is real and what is not real about his memoir? And that is the perfect like analogy for Vietnam. Um, and that is what the, the book is really about, about Vietnam and about like what it did to our understanding of truth and what it did to our understanding of reality on an individual and societal level. And it's one of the best books I've I've ever read. And it's like it has this extra le- level of fun because it's not possible to tell what's real and what's not real. And In the Army with Tim O'Brien is actually the basis of another movie that plays with truth, In the Army Now, starring Polly Short. Right? <laughs> I believe that's true, Mike. Uh, it's the first time I'm hearing it, but I believe it's true. That is an excellent book and a great recommendation. Ryan, what do you got? Um, Catch Me If You Can is such a mo- good movie with good stuff in it, and everybody's doing a good job. And that reminds me of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. <laughs> <laughs> But might actually be a better movie. Uh, aside from that, I think that it's very clear if you listen to this episode that we're all recommending The Fablemans. Not necessarily... Yeah. I think we all liked it or loved it, but also just as a companion piece for this because yeah. it, it is supposed to be like, Why? if you watch this, you watch that. As far as my like sleeper pick goes, I don't know. I don't think this is very famous of a movie, despite being directed by Ridley Scott, uh, starring Nicolas Cage. And the year is next year, 2003. Uh, it's called Matchstick Men. Uh, con artist oh, yeah. movie where uh, a dad and his child and 
their friend, Sam, Rock- Sam Rockwell, who plays Sam Rockwell, uh, they do cons. And a lot of these themes are tackled. Uh, it's not... It's just not Spielberg. It's Ridley Scott. And I think it's a really good example of, you know, w- we tackle Spielberg so much easier, I think, than Ridley Scott. Because Ridley Scott is more of like a, I'm just going to dabble in genres. I'm less of like an auteur. Here's my stamp on every movie. Matchstick Man, I think, gives you a lot of that about how, you know, these untold stories and um, this weird sort of comedy that he's capable of, of like, none of his movies are really comedies, yet they're all... I'll have a ton of funny, great moments. Is is this a famous movie? Matchstick Man? Yeah. No. Only in that it is not. Yeah, I was going to say, only, like, it, yeah. It's, I would it's... say people have heard of it, but they, if you said, okay, now tell me, like, any details about it. They might be able to give you some of the actors. They might be able to give you the, the idea that it's, like, there, it's about men. cons. But it, it's not a famous movie, I would say. The the feelings and the tones are completely different, but the premise is very similar, and also the watchability is very similar. Like these movies, you you can burn through them. It's funny, Ryan. All of this has me mindful for some reason of a nineteen seventy three movie, Paper Moon. Oh, why? Ooh, the like the father child con men. Uh, no, it's it, like it lines up. I just don't know why that's on your mind that year. I'm just I've been in a very 73 state of mind, Ryan. Well, I've been weird. reviewing the movies of 73 and occasionally the movies of 74. Should we call that's Greg's a... doctor? Like this is <laughs> fucked yeah, that's, up. That's, this that's is such f- a weird thing. Yeah. Do you smell <laughs> cookies baking right now? <laughs> hey, Greg's doctor. This is Mike and Ryan again. Stop <laughs> calling me. Jesus Christ. Hey, Joe. <laughs> it's us. Oh, on the uh, weekend, huh? Good, good. So you'll have lots of time to talk to us. <laughs> oh, golfing? Cool. You're just walking then. That's the perfect time to chat. <laughs> uh, my recommendation is uh, similar-ish, I think, to, to yours, Ryan. Is it's, it's about con men. It's about what is truth, how we tell stories, and what it means to be family. Not fatherhood so much, but when you have no parents, you just have your brother, also named Bloom. It's Ryan Johnson's Brothers Bloom, because that is a movie I want to talk about all of the time and make everybody watch all the time. It is delightful. It's not the most, or it's not the least talked about movie that Ryan Johnson made. I think that's The Last Jedi. Just no one ever yes. has a conversation about Nobody that. Nobody ever but, yeah. said anything about that. Have a take it's on The there. Last Jedi, America. I believe that uh, it is his only movie I have not seen. It is it informed. I knew I loved Brick, and then I saw that, and that cemented him as one of my favorite directors, at least. like It's going to be interesting, no matter what he does. Mike, are you just and saying also, you love things you can see in the room? I love things I can see in the room. I love Brick. Especially when his brothers bloom. <laughs> Brick. <laughs> Last Jedi. There's the final <laughs> Jedi is in the corner as well. A loop. Er, uh, it also informed, unfortunately, my like aesthetics and clothes for a while because they both wear vests and suits all of the time. This is Brody? Yep. Vice? Brody, Vice, and Ruffalo. And Ruffalo. Baby. I was going to say Schwartzman, but I'm thinking of Darjeeling. Ruffalo. Do you guys remember when Ruffalo was in movies not as the Hulk? It's he's a good actor. Uh some of our listeners uh over at patreon.com slash your pop filter, you can hear a whole nother twenty five minute segment uh, about Leonardo DiCaprio. And we talked a little bit about Shutter Island and did not mention Ruffalo is great in that, and it's when he is more than the Hulk, man, he's a good actor. <laughs> I've also noticed I don't know if this is important to bring up now, but um, people who do a John C. Riley impression can roll it pretty easily into a Ruffalo impression. It's just like a little <laughs> less cartoony. <laughs> Holy Whoa. cow. <laughs> you just blew my mind, brother. Yeah, that broke my knob. Yeah. The truth. Uh, <laughs> you see that blue light? Yeah, yeah, dude. <laughs> seriously. Just in that shaft. And I can't stand it. I'm like writhing and wriggling in it. <laughs> this is the final time of the season I get to announce who my best friend is. Oh, man, this is the full off-season best friend? Yeah. The full off-season best friend. And I guess it's a race. Like, I know we will compete for whoever the next host's best friend is, but I don't know if the one-way street always – I don't know. I don't know if it's this person's my best friend until the next time I host, which is eight years from now. All good questions. Um, Ryan, you got 90 points. (laughs) Oh, my God. Because I loved giving out points tonight, and uh, you made a lot of good um – and it's the final time I could give up points. That's, Greg, that's you got ninety-one points. Oh, congratulations! Wait, does that mean I? I thought you said he didn't. You get ninety-eight? No, ninety nine zero. Did I win ninety-one 9, 1 to ninety? Ninety-one to ninety. What a basketball game! Ninety. It's like a regular Miami Heat, Denver Nuggets. Ninety is that roughly t- the amount of points that Greg and I scored combined. So, Mike, you were fucking on one, or Greg and I were on one. 
tonight. There are times where one of you would say a sentence, I'd be like, yeah, there's four points for that one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, I feel like I have to mention the fact that there was a time Ryan got a point where you gave me the point instead. You yeah. gave it to oh, him as well, so I think we tied 91 <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> Or ninety. I didn't to 90. write that point down, but okay, good. you know, I appreciate that Greg wants everybody to win. He gives a point away. It's ninety to ninety. Ninety point five to ninety point five. Everybody's everybody's best friend. <laughs> the fucking That's all I want. Cuck ass world Greg wants <laughs> to live in. Everybody likes well, everybody and nobody's mad at me. How is this movie gonna do? It feels like we all really enjoyed watching it and talking about it. I, we, not to like pull the curtain back too much, but uh the beginning of the bracket was seven or eight years ago, so the recency yeah. bias is strong with this one. <laughs> I have to say, we kind of like had two different minds like throughout the entire show. Sometimes it sounded like we were talking about our favorite movie, and sometimes we, it sounded <laughs> like we were talking about it's just it's it's near greatness, and sometimes that is worse than just being good. Is um, it the best Spielberg movie of two thousand two? What's our other option? Minority Report? Mm-hmm. Minority Report. No, Minority Report. I like. I had way more fun watching Minority Report. It, Ma- minority Report seems more important and seems more 2002. So I think it's a great movie, um, made for a great show, but I don't think it's got... It's just, oh, I, I thought you were saying he made it for a great show, movie of the year. <laughs> <laughs> based on... I think this movie's stock has risen a lot recently. And based on the kind of people who like it and what the kind of people who don't get it, not don't get it, but, you know, I think it's definitely a wavelength movie. Like, if you jump, if it gets you on its wave, then you ignore a mm-hmm. lot of things to, yes. you know, the the movie's betterment. If it doesn't totally capture you, then I think those things are far more glaring. I think it totally. does so much right, and then f- in some way that all that all that works about it, it, it's exactly like we were saying about Leo and, and Hanks. So much of it works independently, and then you put it all together, and it just doesn't sing. In, in, in quite the right way. It just doesn't all seem to come together meaning, like meaningfully enough. But great movie, a lot of fun. Spielberg's a genius. Like every scene you come away with the, the knowledge that like he's so good at this, you know? But it just, it's not like gonna beat out all the other 15 movies we have. We're the rare film fans that are going to tell you, uh, we love Spike Lee and Steven Spielberg. Where else are you going to get that? <laughs> That's what movie of the year does. <laughs> We're not afraid to say it. We are out of time for Catch Me If You Can. And so for the final time this season, I can t- say coming up this season <laughs> is only three finale episodes. Until then, keep watching those movies. <laughs>